All right, guys, we are at our last episode of the first part of our Revival History series. And I've got to say, I am more excited about this one than any of them. They're all epic. How can I even say that? No, that's how crazy this one really is. And we're talking 70 years ago. God can do it again, and he wants to. Two themes to look for in this one, threads through the whole story, is number one, is the Holy Spirit is the greatest leader in all of human history. And the Hebrews revival is a picture of his leadership versus our own charisma, man's good ideas, kind of entertainment-driven leadership. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate leader. Number two is we're gonna talk about a simple concept. It's not too late. You may feel like you had the golden opportunity and you didn't step into it. You may have thought, well, if I was younger or in that moment, I want to say to us today, it's not too late. Today is the day to step into obedience, to step into expectation, and God's mercy and His grace is big enough to move right now. We're going to talk about a man named Duncan Campbell, and we're going to go back and tell a little bit of his story leading into the Hebrides revival and a little bit of the story of where those two things collide. But here we go. Duncan Campbell was born in Scotland. He's born into a godly home. Uh, we're talking Bible studies every morning, kind of godly home. But in his teenage years, he goes, enough is enough. I'm done with this Bible stuff, and I'm done with this Christianity thing. And he gives his life wholeheartedly to pleasure and the pursuit of joy. And he's an awesome bagpiper. Yes, you heard right, bagpiper. And the partying of his day, he's like a leader in it. He's a lead bagpiper, a lead dancer, a lead singer. And uh, he would lead these parties that were kind of the revelry of his day in Scotland. So he was as worldly as you kind of could be in that time and in that day. Well, imagine now... Uh, he's got this incredible history and foundation, but now he's pursuing his own personal pleasures. He's mid-celebration, mid-party. He's leading like the bagpipe, you know, chorus. And in the middle of it, they're singing a song, and a lyric of the song reminds him of the Bible studies of his childhood. Something his dad had said, something he'd read out of the scriptures. And that little seed that had been planted in his childhood is all of a sudden watered by the Holy Spirit and conviction hits his heart. He walks off the stage, walks out of the party, tells his friends he's got to go. He doesn't even know why. And he walks out under this weight of the Lord moving on his life. He's kind of stumbling around. It's late. It's 11 o'clock at night. And he sees in the distance that the lights to the local church are on. He's like, why are those guys up this late? He walks up there intrigued and again under the weight of some conviction in his life walks up the steps, and he's too embarrassed to open the door. He's too embarrassed to look through a window. He puts his ear up to the keyhole of the church, and he hears a familiar voice praying with conviction and passion. And it's the voice of his dad. And his dad's praying for his family. His dad's praying for his son. He's praying for his salvation. He's undone. He opens the door of the church. He walks in. He sits next to his dad. What a moment. He's in full Scottish regalia still, bagpipe under his arm. His dad looks over him and says, son, I'm so glad you're here. He's undone by the love of God, under the weight of conviction. He stays for a little while and he can't handle it any longer. He leaves the church. He begins walking home. At two in the morning, he gets home. He walks in the door only to find his mom on her knees praying for his salvation, praying for her family. Had no idea that both of them would be in this place of prayer for him in this moment. His mom gets up. He explains to her that he's under the weight of conviction. He says, I just, I, I need to do something. And she says to him, she says, well, I have guests here and they're sleeping in your bed. You can't go up to your room. She goes, you need to go to the barn and get right with God. That's a good mom. He walks out into the barn. He cries out to God, weight of conviction, confession of sin, and he encounters the love and the forgiveness of God. And he would point to this as his salvation moment. But the story's just beginning. Several months later, he, along with many of the young men of Scotland at the time, are pulled into World War I, and he finds himself on a horse charging into battle in Belgium. Now, they're on horseback, and they're charging against an, uh, an army that he said five to 600 rounds a minute are being shot at them. They're being mowed down. He looks around and horses and men alike are laying all over the battlefield dead already. And soon he is struck, thrown from his horse. His horse lands on top of him, crushes him. He's wounded. 
He look, looks around and all he sees is blood and he's sure he's dying. Now in this moment, the Holy Spirit lands on him and he finds himself grateful for salvation, but convicted that he'd never done anything with his salvation yet, that he'd not really shared the gospel much. He, he's kind of undone by his passivity with his faith. In this moment, the Canadian infantry sends their last cavalry charge. And one of these Canadian horsemen riding across the field, his horse steps on Duncan Campbell's back, who's dying, and he hits him so hard with his hoof that it makes Duncan Campbell gasp. He goes, oh! And it said to his dying day, he had a scar on his backbone from that horse's hoof. And the noise that he makes alerts the Canadian cavalrymen that he's still alive. He rides off, finishes the charge, survives the charge, and goes back to find Duncan Campbell because he knows he's alive. Gets off his horse, grabs Duncan Campbell, and throws him on the back of his horse. He's dying. He's wounded. And Duncan Campbell would later write, as he laid on the back of that horse, he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in a way he didn't even know was possible. He said he knew he was saved, but all of a sudden Jesus became real and he was baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. He gets back to the tent where all the wounded are laying, and now he's in a Canadian camp, and there's all these wounded men everywhere, but he is in an an envelope of the power of the Holy Spirit, and he begins to sing in his native language of Gaelic, and he's just singing his worship to God as he's laying on this cot, injured, and the presence of God fills the tent. And the next thing he knows, he looks around and seven Canadians are on their knees, repenting of their sins, confessing their sins. And they're asking him, do you speak English? And he's singing in Gaelic. And this marked him forever because he looked out and went, man didn't lead this. I didn't do this. It wasn't great preaching. It was the power of the Holy Spirit to convict a person of their sins. And this experience would mark him for the rest of his life, both for faith, for a sovereign outpouring of God, and with the value to let God lead his own outpourings and not to feel that he could muster it in with his own strength or to take over leadership and think he could do it better than the Holy Spirit. Now, fast forward five years, he's working for a faith mission, going door to door. He's seeing so many salvations in Northern Scotland. But then he gets married, starts having children. He feels the pressure that he's got to settle down and have a more stable life. He ends up as a pastor at a local church with a good salary and a comfortable position. He's definitely still got this you know, wild side in his heart, but he knows and he would later write that for 17 years, he knew he was forsaking his calling. Now that's not to say that pastoring isn't a radical call. Of course it's a radical call. It just wasn't what God was calling him to. And he had stepped into it more out of comfort and more out of the desire for stability than out of obedience to God. Critical moment. His 15-year-old daughter wakes up early in the morning. He's already up. He's preparing a sermon, and she starts singing at 5 a.m. Now, this girl is remarkable. She had already committed her life to Nepal, never been there, but as a teenager, had already committed her life to be a missionary in Nepal. So she's already this remarkable young lady. Well, she wakes up, and she is singing. She's worshiping. Duncan calls her into the office, goes, what is happening? Why are you awake and why are you singing? She's filled with joy and she says, dad, I've already been up for an hour in the presence of Jesus and he's been speaking to me and he's like, what is he saying to you? And she says, dad, you've told us the stories of the revival that you saw when you were young. And he goes, she goes, but now you've got a big church and you're a great preacher and people like to listen to you. She goes, but dad, when is the last time that you knelt next to a poor sinner and led them into repentance and the forgiveness of their sins. And he's cut to the heart that he has compromised his calling, that he has lived according to stability and comfort instead of obedience. He goes back into his office. He writes his letter of resignation. He gives up his comfort, his salary, everything he had, and he heads back into his call to revival. Now, Simultaneous, let's move to the Hebrides, an island group nor- on northern Scotland, off the coast. There's a group of people that are starting to contend for revival. It starts with two ladies, two sisters, 82 and 84 years old. Come on, guys. 
82 and 84 years old, and they are stirred with faith that God wants to move. Now, one of them is blind, and one of them is crippled because of a back disease. They essentially can't leave their home, and three nights a week, they're staying up till four or five in the morning, praying for an outpouring in the Spirit. One of those nights, God marks them and says, I'm bringing revival to Hebrides. They take him at his word with a belief that he was going to pour out rain on the dry land. They call their local pastor to the house. He comes and they say, will you stand with us? We believe God has spoken that revival is coming to the Hebrides. He says, yes. He gets a hold of six men. They start meeting in a schoolhouse. The sisters are meeting in their own home. And for months now, <clears throat> now they start for months, they start praying three days a week till two, three, four in the morning for an outpouring of the Spirit. Now the first sign of this comes as the seven men are in a barn. One of them stands up and says, we're praying for revival, but have we had revival? He quotes Psalm 24, that uh, who give us clean hands and a pure heart, that we can ascend the holy hill of the Lord. And, and it was like, they said when that happened, it was like the heavens opened up. The glory of God was poured out. It was like they were being shaken by the power of God. They were trembling under his presence and they believed that revival was now coming. Now the same night, the two sisters are praying in their house and they get caught up in this visitation of God's presence and God speaks to them, call Duncan Campbell. He's going to be catalytic to this move of God. Next day, they write a letter of invitation to Duncan Campbell. It gets to him however much longer. And he reads the invitation, goes, that's amazing. He goes, but my life is booked for the next number of months. He writes them back, says, I cannot come. But how many you know God had other plans? And the power of prayer was prevailing in this situation. Every, all of his commitments, they cancel. All of them. All of his pre, you know, all of the things that he was already committed to, <clears throat> they get canceled. And he realizes he has this one standing invitation to the Hebrides. And God clearly speaks to him, he's to go. Without writing a letter back, he just shows up at the Hebrides. In fact, he's not said he's coming. The last thing he said was that he wasn't coming. But when he gets to the docks, who's there to meet him? But one of the pastors who had written the letter. And he's standing at the docks, meeting him there. And it's there on the docks that he says to him, hey, we knew you were coming. In fact, we prepared a room for you. We prepared a meal for you. And he says, but before you eat, would you be willing to preach one time? Duncan Campbell goes up to the chapel on the way to that house he was going to stay at. It's about uh, 10 o'clock at night, and he preaches the first message, and he says it was okay. There wasn't a massive reaction. He dismisses, and he's thinking, okay, it's over. We're going to go back to the house. As they're walking out the back door, there's a man who stands up in the back, and he starts to pray passionately with all of his heart out of Psalm 24. Lord, clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. He's praying with such passion that everyone stops and just listens. And for 30 minutes, he cries out in travail for a move of God, for repentance, for clean hands and a pure heart. By the time he's done praying, 600 more people had gathered outside. They looked back later and went, where did they come from? came from? They began to interview them later as to how that had even happened. They found that one group of a hundred young people had been at a party just down the road. When the conviction of sin landed, they ended the party and they just started walking towards the church. Now keep in mind, this is like, this is like 11 o'clock at night. 600 people are standing outside the church. They all move into the church and now there's eight, 900 people in the church. Um, and outpouring revival hits. It's not even Duncan Campbell's great preaching. The Spirit of God falls. People are confessing their sins. They're repenting. This goes on till three in the morning. He still hasn't eaten. He still hasn't gone back to the house. Three in the morning now. Eight, nine hundred people filling the church. Finally, they dismiss. He walks out the back only to find a man that was looking for him. Says, Duncan, 400 people have gathered at the police station and they're sitting there travailing and repenting of their sins. Can you please come? Duncan Campbell goes to the police station. He didn't need to preach. People were getting encountered. They were experiencing the love and the forgiveness of God. They were being soundly born again, converted, turning their lives to Jesus. And by 4 a.m., he finally makes it 
home, and this would mark the beginning of the Hebrides outpouring. From this point on, city to city, town to town, you couldn't find a place where prayer meetings weren't bubbling up. In a couple of those towns, I'll give you a couple of their names that were just remarkable little moments in a town called Arnold. Uh, Cam- Duncan Campbell was asked to come there, but not by the churches. They were resistant to the manifestations of the Spirit that were happening. They were resistant to the outpouring. So they said, would you please still come? There's so many of us that are hungry and we'll meet together in a barn. They meet in that barn and they're, they're having a good time, but Duncan Campbell knows they're not having the breakthrough. So he sees a man and feels the Holy Spirit says that that's the man that's meant to pray. He's the blacksmith in the community. So he invites him. He says, would you please pray? I feel the Holy Spirit has prompted me. For 30 minutes, they wait in silence. The guy's just waiting to pray. I don't know, waiting for revelation. Can you imagine how awkward this moment was? It'd be so easy to give up, interject. Campbell was committed to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We see it again and again and again. When he could have stepped in and been the great preacher, when he could have stepped into the police station and given the great message and taken credit for all their salvations, when he could have just been the great preacher till three or four in the morning, he stepped back and he let the Holy Spirit move. And he always believed that it was the Holy Spirit was the greatest evangelist in human history. He knew how to lead someone to Jesus better than Duncan did, better than anyone else did. And so in this moment, Duncan Campbell waits in silence under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. After 30 minutes of silence, the blacksmith begins to pray. For another 30 minutes, he travails in prayer. And then the Holy Spirit comes and everyone there says that the wind of the Holy Spirit came into the barn and the whole building was shaking with the power of God, just like the early church, literally, tangibly shaken by the power of God. And this town, this community that had been resistant to the move of God, it was said there wasn't a single home in the town where someone hadn't been affected by the move of God and given their lives to Jesus. Now in that meeting was a young man, a teenager, his name was Donald, and he had gotten saved in that blacksmith prayer meeting. And so now fast forward to another town, uh, another little community called Bernia. And uh, again, Duncan Campbell's invited to this town uh, and he goes there and this young Donald, this teenager, becomes one of his traveling associates. He comes with them. They're at the meeting. It's similar. There's no, gr- nothing great really happening. They're contending for a breakthrough. And he looks down and he sees young Donald crying and there's a puddle of tears in front of him. And he goes, gosh, there's something on him. And he invites him to pray. And this young teenager stands up in front of everyone and talks about the Lamb of God sitting on the throne. He talks about the majesty of God and he invites everybody to gaze upon the Lamb, the throne, and to see Jesus. And when he does that, again, the Spirit of God is poured out. People start confessing their sins. They start repenting. Some of them are caught up in trances. The power of God just fell with incredible, incredible power. And this happened again and again, town after town, community after community, all across the Hebrides. This became the Hebrides revival. This spread into nearby regions. People were struck with faith. People were, uh, every town was filled with numerous prayer meetings and it said that well whereas before not a single young person could be found in the church now the churches were flooded with young people and it was no longer could you get people to the prayer meeting they couldn't get them out of the prayer meetings they were caught up in the spirit of God here's what we want to say as we wrap up our final episode to this revival history series as we look back now only 70 years in our history to the Hebrides outpouring is that we want to say that God wants to do it again. And he wants to do it through unlikely people like you and I. He wants to do it through unlikely people that have had to overcome obstacles, who have had to choose humility, have had to overcome rejection. He wants to do it through those that are maybe not the most qualified in the eyes of the world, maybe not the greatest preachers, the most gifted, or have the most charismatic personalities. He wants to do it through those that maybe have felt like they missed the boat a little bit, feel like that revival's kind of sailed past them, they're too old, or they missed their opportunity. And yet those are the very ones that God wants to use to move in great power. He wants to use those of us that feel a little bit disqualified, feel just too normal, too average. No, those are the very ones, you and I, the everyday believer that God wants to use to bring great outpouring to our towns, to our cities, to see our towns and cities shaken by the power of God once again. There is no reason to believe that what God did in Herrenhut, Germany, what God did in Wales, what God did in Ulster and South Africa, what he did in the Hebrides, what he did in Azusa Street, there's no reason to believe 
that these are simply stories that we will always reflect on as amazing stories and not believe that God would do it again today. He wants to fill us with faith. He wants to fill us with urgency, and he wants to fill us with expectation. Now is the time for global great awakening. Now is the time and to real, rise up and to realize you are the solution for your community. You are the solution for your city. You, filled with the Holy Spirit, living in breakthrough prayer, hungry for God and willing to go anywhere for the sake of the gospel, we are the very ones that God wants to use for this next incredible move of the Spirit all over the earth. Now, before we wrap this up, I'll give you the last two application points that we talked about at the very beginning. And one of those is the power of the Holy Spirit versus the leadership of, uh, of just of people. And I think for far too often, we all recognize we're trying to strong arm the move of God. And if we can get the right, you know, entertainment, the right ambiance, the right building, the right mood, the right worship team, the right speaker, the right conference, then maybe God will move. And we simply don't see that in many of these outpourings, including the Hebrides. We see the Holy Spirit as the great orchestrator and the great leader. And all we find are people who are willing to say yes to that. Number two, as we would talk about the missing of our opportunities, you know, you look at Duncan Campbell's life and you just wonder after 17 years of kind of giving up his high calling and even what he'd already experienced and settling for comfort that maybe it was too late. Maybe that was it. Maybe he was going to have five remarkable years in God and then just kind of live out the rest of his years in, in comfort and good stuff, but maybe not what God had fully called him to. And yet that is not the end of Duncan Campbell's life. The end of Duncan Campbell's life is that repentance leads to breakthrough. And when he wrote that letter of resignation, it was game on. And God goes, I can use you now just like the day I encountered you on the back of that horse. And it's the same for us today. No matter our history, no matter um, a feeling of disqualification, no matter whether we feel like we kind of missed it a little bit or our opportunity, we're too old, we're too this, we're too that. Uh-uh. Today, God wants to pour out his spirit on a fresh on us. Today, he wants to fill us with courage and confidence that our simple yes can change all of human history.